It's my, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to uh, Innis Town Hall. Uh, my name is Peter Lowen. I'm the director of the School of Public Policy and Governance. And I've got a wonderful uh, job today. Uh, it's to uh, introduce our guest of honor and our speaker today, uh, Muhammad Yunus. He needs no introduction. Um, I'll note four things about him uh, in increasing uh, order of, uh, of uh, impressiveness, importance, uh, renown. He was awarded uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, the Nobel Peace Prize. The most important and impressive thing about him is that he conceived of uh, and has deployed a form of uh, finance, of credit, of interacting between people and empowering them that has changed the lives of millions of people uh, around the world, that allows them to unleash uh, all of their creative potential, their desire to make themselves better and their communities better. Uh, and in doing it, he's presented us with a remarkable uh, and indeed a unique model of how uh, we can work together, uh, exchange with one another, uh, and build a better world. He's on a tour uh, around the world right now, uh, and he uh, is, as I understand it, almost always on the road. Uh, and he's spending some time with us today to talk about his new book, uh, A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Net Carbon Emissions. And I won't say any more than that because uh, we should hear from him and not from me. So please join me in welcoming uh, Muhammad Yunus to the University of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here again, back again in this campus. Um, I have. Uh, been an alumnus of the university because I received an honorary doctorate long years back. So it's good to reconnect with their campus that uh, I have been with it for a long time. Uh, this time, uh, Peter mentioned I'm on a world tour, sounds like I'm everywhere. Actually, I came to Canada. On the way back, I'm going to uh, South Korea. That's about it. <laughs> Uh, but it's around the world, that's true. <laughs> that makes it around the world tour. Uh, this time it's about the book, which Peter mentioned, The World of Three Zeros, uh, Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, Zero Net Carbon Emission. Those ideas have been developing and discussing about those things for many years because of the work that I've been doing in Bangladesh. Uh, one, you are many of you are familiar with. It's called microcredit, small loans for poor people, particularly poor women. Uh, we started it back in 1976, about 41 years back, uh, and became uh, spread out around the world. So we do it in Bangladesh, we do it other places. Many people around the world have uh, introduced that in their own work, both in the poor countries, also rich countries, developed countries, in all circumstances. So my attention was on the poor people and see how that can be helped. They can be helped to get out of poverty. And naturally, people ask me the question, why poverty? What is the reason people become poor and remain poor? And through my experience, I tried to understand and give a response to that question in the way I felt. And I came with the re response, and I check it out again and again whether I'm doing the right thing, saying that. And I reconfirm it. Yes, that's what the root cause of poverty. One way I tried to explain it, that poverty is not caused by, created by poor people. So it's not coming from them. Then where is it coming from? Poverty is created by the system that we have created. That causes the poverty. If that is ex this explanation is acceptable, then something comes as a policy in order to overcome poverty, in order, in order to Eliminate poverty. We have to fix the system. Because the seed of poverty is in the system. If we somehow can pick up those seeds of poverty from the system, 
nobody will be a poor person. There's nothing wrong with poor people. I try to give an image to what I'm saying by an analogy. I say it's like a bonsai tree. You take the seed of the tallest tree in the forest and then put the seed in the flower pot to grow. And the seed will grow, it will germinate. And you'll have a tree coming out of it. But it will stop after a while. It will not grow beyond two feet or three feet or three and a half feet, something like that. It will be a beautiful replica of the tree that we saw originally in the forest, but not as tall as the one that we saw, not as giant of a tree as we saw. It looks so cute, we call them bonsai. And we keep them in our living room in a favorite place. You ask the question, why this tree didn't grow as tall as the other one? The answer is very clear. Because we didn't give this soil base on which the seed could grow into a big, tall tree. It's not the fault of the seed. Seed was a good seed. So I try to explain by saying, poor people are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed. They're as good as anybody else. Simply, society never gave them the space, never gave them the environment, so that they can grow as tall as everybody else. And that's the root cause of all the problems that we see as a poverty. So if that is so, what is it wrong in the system? What went wrong in the system? Which part particularly you paid attention to? One that I paid attention to out of necessity, not because it came out. I hope it, I hope it will stick around for a while. Yeah. Uh, because I was struggling with that one, is the financial system. We built a huge, intricate financial system in the world. But amazing thing, almost half the population of the entire world are left out of it. It's the bottom half of the population. If you have 8 billion people on this planet, you can draw a line in the middle. You can easily see these people are not connected with the financial system. And the finance plays a very important role in people's life. When you disconnect them from the financial system or never extended that financial system to them, they're in big trouble. I try to explain it by saying, finance is like economic oxygen to for people. If we don't have oxygen in this room, we'll be gasping. We cannot breathe, and then we'll collapse. We cannot function anymore. If you deny the economic oxygen to people, they economically feel the same way. They remain dysfunctional. They collapse. And that's what we call poverty. They cannot function. If you connect them with the economic oxygen, they become alive, active. They can participate in the economy because they bring their creative power to address the issues that they have, confront. So vital is the thing called financial services. But we have not paid attention to it. We accidentally, not that I would this was my PhD dissertation or something that I have to, nothing like that. It was not my research topic or anything. Accidentally, I got involved with it. I had no reason to get involved with it. But circumstances in Bangladesh were so desperate back in the middle of 70s. <clears throat> I somehow 
out of desperation, got involved with it. The simple thing that I did, I was frustrated like everybody else in the country, with desperate situation, famine in the country and so on. I was trying to see in the village next door to the university campus, if I could be of some use to somebody. Because the subject that I teach to my class, I get a feeling that's a useless subject. It's called economics. <laughs> it has no meaning in the life of the people that live next door. And here I am explaining all those beautiful, elegant theories. And I felt this, I'm doing something terrible. The things cannot help me to address the issues that outside the door. I'm enthusiastically carrying it on to pass it on to the young people. So I'm not doing justice to myself. I felt I'm a useless person. So I was trying to find some use for me. So one idea that why don't I go to the village next door and see I can make myself useful to at least one person. I cannot be useful to many persons. That ability, that quality I don't have. But as a human being, I can be of some assistance somehow to somebody. So that was a simple idea. And out of that came many little things in that village. But I learned a lot from the village in return. One of the things I learned terrified me, the loan sharking in the village. You read about loan sharking in stories, in plays, in, you watch it in movies, how terrible it is, how cruel a human being can be to another human being. Just by lending tiny little money, you grab everything the other person has. So lending is just a pretext. It is no business relationship at all. It's a grabbing mechanism. And funny thing, when I see this, I feel terrible, but I can't do anything. It goes on right in front of my eyes. And I get very angry with the, my subject again, economics. Economics never taught me what to do with the loan sharks. Or all, in all my studies, I never had one paragraph about loan sharks. And this is the real right in front of me. Again, I felt I'm a useless person. I learn things which has no use for me. So I was fuming inside of me, not knowing what to do, because I don't know anything. So one sudden thought that came to my mind, why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, people will come to me. They don't have to go to loan shark. Problem for them will be solved. They will not be able to, they will not be victims of the loan sharks. I could protect them. I immediately went into it. I didn't write, sit down, write a big research proposal to be undertaken for the next three years to study loan sharking in one village in Bangladesh. None of the sort. I just wanted to get things done right away. And this, I thought, just fits me right. So I started giving money out of my pocket. And people loved it. And tried to do things in a systematic way so that I can keep track of them. Now that it's become popular, more and more people coming from other villages and so on. After a couple of years, I thought, this cannot go on like this. Why don't I create a bank to continue this? That's the first idea came that I should create a bank. Then question came, what kind of bank? I immediately dismissed the banks that exist in front of me. I said, not that kind of bank. Again, it will go the same way. 
I wanted to create the bank the way I work, already I've been working, to protect and promote that banking. But with the existing law, I cannot do that. Existing law became the barrier for me. So my campaign, my lobbying began to create a new law, to create a bank for the poor people. Everybody rejected it, everybody laughed at it. What is a bank for the poor people? It doesn't make sense. They're so contradictory to each other, bank and the poor people. I said, no, they need the bank. So finally, in 80, 1983, we got the permission and became a bank. Named it Grameen Bank or Village Bank. Started in 76, by 93 we became a bank. I was so happy, now I can do it as much as I want. And enthusiastically we kept on expanding. What special privilege that I got by creating a new law? I got enormous flexibility to avoid what the conventional banks do. I tried to explain to my colleagues and whoever trying to understand what I do and how I do, people tell me, oh, how did you decide on each rule and procedure that you put into your bank? Did you do a lot of research on that? I said, no, research is not my kind of thing. I just go and do things and try it out. If you call that a research, maybe that's a research. Otherwise, it's not the conventional thing that I do. So I, made, I said I made my life simple. I like simple things. Whenever I need a rule or a procedure, I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. <laughs> and it worked away. Literally, if you look at Grameen Bank, examine each piece of work, it's just opposite of what conventional banks do. They go to the rich, we go to the poor, obviously. They want to work in the city center, they work only in the cities. They never work in the village. So I transferred. I said, we go to the remote village. Today, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh has 2,600 branches all over the country. None of the branch is in any city, any town in Bangladesh. All in the rural areas. Even today, after 41 years. And they continue like that. That's how seriously we took it. In order to do banking with the conventional bank, you have to come to their office, explain to them what you want, and explain to them how good you are in your business so that they get confidence in you to talk to you. We do the reverse. We made a basic principle right from day one. People should not come to the bank. Banks should go to people. And we have been following that principle ever since. Today, we have over 9 million borrowers of Grameen Bank, spread over all over the country. We, from Grameen Bank, go and meet all these 9 million borrowers in 80,000 villages, do the business at their doorstep, even today. It never missed. Wherever the Grameen idea went, it follows the same thing. We dismiss the whole idea of collateral from banking. And we created the banking without any legal papers, without any documentation from the legal side. So I said, Grameen Bank is the only bank in the world which is lawyer free. There's no lawyer in our bank. But still it works. People get shocked. Are you sure it will work tomorrow? I said, it has been working for 41 years. And I have no reason why not to believe that it will work tomorrow. We lend out, last year we lend out over two and a half billion dollars. No papers. Our banker friends get very scared. Are you sure this money will come back? 
I said, it always does. So this is the way we continued. This is the conventional banking that we are talking about, conventional finance system. Then I raised the question of the economic theory, where it misinterprets human being. That's another cause of poverty. It interprets human being in a very funny way. It interprets human being as someone who is driven by self-interest. That's the core of economics, self-interest, meaning selfishness. And is human being driven only by selfishness? I said, I don't agree it at all. Real human being is so different. Human being is driven by selfishness and selflessness together. But selflessness has been removed from the economic theory. So it created a world of greed, selfishness. Nobody has any time to pay attention to problems of other people. That led to the institutions and everything becoming self-centered, created poverty and all other problems. So this is one. Then we I tried to include selflessness into economic theory. I said, in order to include it, we have to create a new kind of business. <coughs> Selfishness creates a profit-maximizing business. What kind of business we should be if it is a selfless business? It's a business to solve problem rather than make money. So we started creating a lot of those companies which are devoted in solving people's problems rather than make money for themselves. And we gave it a name, we called them social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. Now it's growing. We have done it in Bangladesh. We have been doing it in Bangladesh for many years. Now it's being popular subject in many countries. Many big companies coming forward to do social business. We have joint ventures with big companies to do social business. So another way. I said, look, it's a natural thing. It's not forcing by, it's not a force by the government that you have to do it. It's a natural thing. It's in your heart, it's in yourself. You want to do it, you do it. You want to bring clean water in a village so that people have safe drinking water? And you create a business to sell water, not to make money from them, but to make sure it is a sustainable business. You can cover the cost. Make it as cheap as possible, as clean as possible, so that it's safe water. But it's affordable to everybody. That's not a rocket science. Anybody can do that. We can take five unemployed young people out of unemployment by creating a business. Not to make money, but to solve the problem of five unemployed people. If I know how to solve the problem of five unemployed people, I found the formula to solve the problem of unemployed people anywhere. Millions of them. You just repeat the same formula because you know how to do that. So people bring their creative power, that's all. The last point that I'll mention before I conclude, I, capitalist system, the theory that we have, made a mistake about human being on another thing. They, they created a system where everybody has to go and work for somebody else. Job is the central thing in the entire theory. If you have no job, the whole economy collapses. I said, why people have to work for somebody else? Is this what human beings are born for? And my answer is no. Human beings are made into job seekers as an artificial way. Theory made them do that. Natural human being is, is not someone who is looking for a job. Natural human being is a go-getter. That's where our history, the past history of human being. When we are living in the caves, we are not sending job applications to anybody. You figure it out, when did the job application come in human history? Not too far long, very recent. So entrepreneurship is in our blood, but we discarded that. That is the essence of human being. I said, if we now put 
into the theory that all human beings are entrepreneurs. Entire system changes. And then people argue with me. No, that's not right. Not everybody can be entrepreneur. Natural thing is to take a job. I said, what made you think so, that not everybody is entrepreneur? I think everybody is entrepreneur. So your thinking versus my thinking. How do you resolve it? I said, I can resolve it from my side. I've been lending money to poor women in Bangladesh. Now it's spread all over the world. Now hundreds of millions of microcredit recipients all over the world. What do they do with microcredit? Do they send a job application with microcredit? No. They start a business. So if 9 million borrowers in Grameen Bank alone, forget about many other organizations in Bangladesh, who do the same thing, can convert themselves into entrepreneurs just because they got the money. Illiterate rural women turning themselves as entrepreneurs. It's not a selective process. We lend money to any woman who is a poor person. We didn't say, are you an entrepreneur? We never asked that. We didn't have a test whether she has the entrepreneur. Simply she said, I want to take this money. I want to start this business. Here is the money. So irrespective of where she is from, what background she is from, if an illiterate woman can become an entrepreneur, I said, nobody can convince me otherwise. All human beings are entrepreneurs. The moment we include that entrepreneurship into our theory, entire theory changes. We have no problem of this, poverty, and so on. So this is an issue that I've been raising. And that led me to other issues, a massive issue of wealth concentration. All the wealth now is concentrated in few hands. 1% of the entire population, 1%, own more wealth or own more than 99% of the entire wealth of the world. Eight people, which has been announced, eight people own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population. And it gets worse every year. That's what the capitalist system is all about. All the wealth is pushed upwards. So it becomes a big mushroom of wealth, expanding mushroom of wealth, owned by fewer and fewer people, handful of people. The stem of the mushroom is the wealth owned by 99.9% .9 of the population. And we say this is a grand economic structure. It is not. It is a mockery of economic system. We're simply going through it. It's a, basically an explosive situation. It's a ticking time bomb. When it continues, it gets worse. When 1% won all, all the wealth of the world, very little will be left for the rest of the people. People will not take it easy. It will express in political ways, in economic ways, in social ways. There will be a lot of anger in the system, which makes the system collapse. So that's the danger that I keep thinking. I said, the only way out is to go back, revisit the entire structure of economic theory, and redesign it so that wealth doesn't go all the way up. Well, it comes down, shared by everybody else. And how it can be done? Human capability. This is the thinking process that created the theory. Another thinking process will create the counter theory to make it do other way around. And I suggested some of those issues in the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Go back. Yeah, let's have a seat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn on my microphone. Um, for those of you at the back, could you hear both of us fine? OK, great. Um, I just want to ask a few questions, then I'll invite you to come up to the microphone to, um, to ask your own questions uh, of, uh, of our uh, very, honored, very honored guest. I want to, I want to uh, note uh, from the start the, the, the very distinct ways that your bank was different and your approach was different. And it was, as you noted, that you went to the poor and not to the rich, that you went to villages and not to cities. Uh, but the big one is that you went to women and not to men. And that this was, this, was a, this was the great revolution. And can you give us a sense of what you 
what was it and how did it happen that you were able to, to make that change? There were other barriers there, surely cultural barriers and barriers in the family. But what were the things that, that, the, that the bank did and learned about how it could empower women to, to take on this credit to become entrepreneurs, to, to change their villages? Uh, this didn't happen on any uh, theoretical ground or any particular perspective. Again, I was reacting to the existing situation. When I was trying to convince people uh, in the country that uh, we need banks to extend their facility to the poor people, uh, they all said, well, we do best we can. It's not possible to lend money to poor people. They're not credit worthy. The question that uh, <clears throat> raised that they are not credit worthy, I said, should they tell people that they are not credit worthy? Or people should tell them that they are not people worthy? So that's a real issue. So they have to fix themselves rather than people fix themselves to fit them. You are doing completely upside down. I said, not only banks don't lend to the poor people, they also don't lend to the women. So this is an extra argument I push into that. And of course, this created an uproar among the bankers. I said, yes, this is true, because this is your record says. Not even 1% of all the borrowers by all the comp banks together, not even 1% happen to be women. I said, something terribly wrong in your system. They said, no, no, they don't come to us. I said, no, they do. But your rules are very skewed. When a woman, even a rich woman, when she comes with a big, beautiful proposal, business proposal, bank manager will always kind of flip through the proposal and say, have you discussed it with your husband? And she says, yes. She says, why didn't you bring your husband next Monday? I said, have, has any manager in Bangladesh ever asked a man who brought his proposal, have you discussed it with your wife? Why did you bring your wife along so that we can discuss? I said, that's where you go wrong. So when I began, finally, start with my work, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women because of the fight that I launched with the bankers. And it was extremely difficult to get to women. But we didn't give up. We said, let's continue. My, the girl, we had to have the girl student to do that because men student cannot do that to go to the women. They said, well, they don't want it because they say um, they're not, uh, they have no experience of handling money in their life. They never touch money in their life. They are scared to do that. They keep saying, give it to my husband. And maybe we should not force them to take money. I said, no, I'm not forcing them. I said, when a woman says, I don't know how to handle money, I never had experience of handling money, always remember, this is not her voice. It is the voice of the history which made her. And that history is a very painful history. So we have to go back to her again and again to build confidence in her. Because history never gave them any confidence, only fears. She is covered with fears and fears and fears. So our job is to peel off those layers and layers of fear so that real person finally can emerge. If one or two women finally see that, yes, she will try, our j first job is done, that she has at least we found somebody. If they are successful, this will impact on her neighbors. How did she do it? Maybe I should do it too. And the snowball effect will begin. It took us six years to come that 50-50 level. And we celebrated mm -hmm. that we did it finally. Everybody said it cannot be done. Women cannot handle money. Now they're doing it as good as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Then we saw money going to the family through, uh, through women brought much more benefit in the family than the same amount of money going to the family through men. It's very vivid, very clear. We then raised the question, why 50-50? Why didn't you remove that barrier? Open it up. Because if the same money can bring so much more benefit, let's go through the door which makes it happen. Focus on women. So I started focusing on women but for a very practical reason. Now, gradually it became 90, 95, 96. So at, at 97, we kind of stopped. So no more, let's have some men left into the system. 
But when we did it in the USA, I mean America, which we have now more than 100,000 borrowers there, is 100% women, not a single man. So that's how we did it. I'd like you to, I'd like you to, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned it, because I'd like you to talk about the experience of the bank in the United States. Oh. So we, you know, we might, if, if you were me, uh, not knowing much about it, I, I would have imagined that, the, that essentially every financial sector is covered in the United States. Um, it's obviously not the case. But, but talk to us about how your bank has, has moved into the United States, the population it's serving, and, and how the things you've seen, all the transformations in the developing world are happening, uh, you know, right at our doorstep here. Just the first part of your question, that uh, maybe bank is doing good work. As long as there is a payday lenders in any place, you know your financial system is not working. Mm -hmm. As long as there's a pawn shop supplies, you know your financial system is not working. So this is a vivid sign. You don't have, it is not hidden. You have to go and dig it up. It's there with big sign, big advertisement in the newspaper and television. Come here, we lend you money, no question asked. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the lending rate is thousand percent, two thousand percent, three thousand percent. That's what the other financial system is all about. So that's a very vivid. All over, everywhere you go, you see that. So that's a failure of the financial system. The whole thing began not because of the failure of the financial system. Every time I come to the United States, talk about microcredit, and there are many microcredit programs come over from other countries. The American microcredit program, they keep saying that we tried in the United States, but through many, many organizations, it doesn't work. It is not fit for the United States. And I always keep insisting, no, it is appropriate for any country. It's a human being who is deprived from the financial system. This is the system that you can try. This is the best way to do. No, it doesn't work. Then why doesn't it work for us? I said, because you don't know how to do it. It's a very simple reason. Don't blame the people for that. So they, they challenged me to do it myself. I said, why don't you come and do it and show us how to do it? So that's how it began. And that challenge was given in 2007, and we started in 2008, January. I sent someone from Bangladesh, who is with Grameen Bank, who's set up branches, and he's a good person to set up a branch. I said, you go and set up another branch in New York City. He was shocked. He said, I don't know anything about New York City. I said, you don't have to know anything about New York City. We are not, we are not choosing you because you're expert on New York City. We are choosing you because you're expert in Grameen Bank. So do exactly what you want to do and, do, and don't listen to anybody. This is number one instruction. <laughs> <laughs> they are so experts in everything. They will tell you, do this, do this. You can't, you can't do this. You can't do this. Don't listen to it. Just do the way you think you have been doing. And he did it. He did a very good job. We had a very good branch. And that excited everybody to have other branch and other branch. Now we have 20 branches in 12 cities, seven branches in New York, and branches in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, and many other places. We know total of total 12 cities. Over 100,000 borrowers. We have given a total of over a billion dollars in loan. And in the last 10 years, almost perfect Repayment record, 99.6% repayment record in all the branches. No difference between one city and another city, exactly the same. And cover its cost. So this is 100% women. These will work, they do. Like uh, women who used to work in a house cleaning company. She lost her job sitting there doing nothing. She joins the Grameen program and take a loan to buy some cleaning machine and back into business, a single person business. Pass around her business card. If you need to clean your house, this is the number you call. And I do it. I have like so many years of experience and so on. And the popular one is uh, hairdressing. It's a very popular one. They go into a pop they, all they have to do is rent a chair and buy the supplies and be in the business. All they need is money to buy the chair, rent the chair and buy the supplies, and immediately that. And another popular one is uh, uh, taking care of pets, dogs and cats. I said in million years in Bangladesh, will not. 
will not take dog walking as a business. <laughs> but in New York, it's a business. They do business, we fund them and sign us. Very interesting thing, ornament making, designing, and so on, big business. Everybody's doing something, they have come up with something. Something relevant, something people want, and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of things. In city by city, you see little difference, but basically same trend, same kind of thing. And is, is the model the same of having the, the, the borrowers in, in, in small groups? Where yeah, we, that's, that's the point I wanted to summarize quickly. I said, you do exactly what you do in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Don't pay any attention to anybody. Mm -hmm. Because people always say, no, no, the group thing will not work in the USA. Mm -hmm. These are independent-minded people. They don't want to share anything with anybody. I said, they will say 101 things. Don't pay attention. Do exactly what you want. Now they're very enthusiastic to do the group. Very enthusiastic, they have the central meeting. These are essential part of the government system. They gather together. Hardly anybody absent themselves in the central meeting every week. That's where the banking and everything mm -hmm. goes into a practice and so on. They enjoy it. Because basically, people in, uh, unlike Bangladesh, people in New York and many in the cities in the USA, they don't have friends. They don't know who lives next door. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk to the person they see every day. Mm -hmm. Now, for the first time, they became friends. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed. They said, we are not, never going to quit this. Because for the first time, I have friends here. That's it. It's a so we it's followed a, everything. It's yeah. a wonderful it's success. It. Yeah. It's a wonderful we'll success. like it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you about, um, uh, I want to ask you two more questions, and then I'll, I'll uh, invite you to uh, come into the aisle to ask uh, your, own, uh, your own queries. One has to do with, the, with that, is that big suite of global problems. You talked about inequality. There is the, there is the, the, the it's not looming, the threat is here, uh, and it's real of climate change. Um, and there is right now a massive uh, global crisis over migration. Um, I mean, Bangladesh, your, your own country, has been uh, very much in the, in the international spotlight on that, uh, on that issue as a receiving country of uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of refugees. But, but globally, uh, migration is, is, a, is a bigger and more vexing problem than it's ever been, uh, it's ever been before. What, what, what are the insights you have on, on those two issues, um, both from the perspective that you, that you quick, come from? <clears throat> just quickly on this issue. Uh, inequality, wealth inequality, I just mentioned. Uh, sometimes they call it income disparity. Sometimes they call it, um, describe the poor people as the bottom of the pyramid. And I always raise the question, where do you see the pyramid? I don't see any pyramid. I see the mushroom. Pyramid means there's layers and layers. I don't see that. Everything is in one place. You have everything put in one place, there is no pyramid. Pyramid, these steps. So I said, mushroom is a good example rather than pyramid and bottom of the pyramid. No matter how you draw those lines, you cannot come up with the pyramid. So we should get rid of this word, bottom of the pyramid and the pyramids. Uh, the danger is not in the mushroom itself. Danger is the continuous speed of expansion of the pyramid. If you cannot stop that expansion, all the wealth of the world will end up in that pyramid. That's the danger part of it. We'll still have some left for us to survive, but pyramid will, uh, sorry, mushroom will get everything there. So that's what I have been describing as the ticking time bomb. Mm. Unless we are aware of it, we seem, don't seem to pay any attention to it. We go along as you, mm. looking at the growth rate, looking at this, not talking about this. Uh, and you mentioned refugees and the uh, immigrants. And I mentioned that uh, eight people own more wealth than the bottom 50%. And 1% of the population owning 99% of the wealth of the entire world. Where do this 1% live? This is a natural question. They own 99% of the wealth. Mm -hmm. Funny thing. Half a dozen countries of the world. Half a dozen countries of the world own 99% of the wealth because they live there. Meaning the rest of the world has less than 1% of the wealth. So the, all the honey is here. If all the honey is here, bees will be here. It's a natural thing. Because you created that system. You say, why are you coming to my country? Because you control all the wealth. 
because you created a system so that wealth flows in only one direction. Even where it is only 1% is distributed among many, many countries. Mm -hmm. Take the case of India. The, about a week back, there's a, state, there's a report in the Indian press. 1% of the Indian own more than 73% of the wealth of all of India. 1% and 73%. So it's, even whatever little left in this country, still you have the same tendency. Mm -hmm. Go to a smaller country, you see the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger part. The, you call it refugees, you call it unemployment, <coughs> you call it political tensions, all are rooted into it. <coughs> My fear is, with all those tensions, still the world is going on, and it's growing expansion of the economy is taking place. Expansion of the economy is taking place. Whose economy is expanding? Is the 99% wealth getting bigger? 99%. That's all. Our expand, the people at the bottom, their economy is not expanding. That's the tension. That's why we created Brexit. The Brexit political explanation is very simple. That the foreigners are coming, taking away your jobs. Unless you stop the foreigners coming to our country, we cannot improve your life. So vote for us, we'll stop the foreigners coming to our country by quitting European Union. Mm. Very simple argument. Well, yeah, and people went for it. Yeah. And, and like most simple arguments, probably not so, right, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a big, because yeah. politicians can, they know the problem. Mm -hmm. The explanation politicians gave is a completely wrong explanation. Mm -hmm. They didn't put fingers to the wealth concentration. They put the fingers to another poor guy coming from another country to seek a life for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they say, he's your enemy. Mm -hmm. I'll stop coming in. So I stopped visas. I got immigration. And to stop the legal entry, I stopped European Union. That became the Brexit. And same thing happened in the USA. The argument was, build a wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't, and get away from the, all the international trade, because our trade is taking jobs. Mm -hmm. So you make those victims, those are the victims for you, which made your uh, problem created. So let's get out of them. So those are the wrong explanation. You can go on for a while, yeah. but ultimately whole explanation will fall, because Brexit has not helped them. Or wall, even if it built someday, if it does, Trump succeeds, uh, it will not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to come up with another explanation, mm -hmm. explanation expl without touching the real issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying you get ready for the real issue. Either say this is not true, wealth concentration is not there, okay. Then you prove that the world will be happy. Mm -hmm. But if there is wealth concentration, because of all the reports says there is wealth concentration, and in an ugly way, mm -hmm. in an obscene way. So how do we accept that kind of thing? If we are kind of promoting that economy, promoting that structure, we have to go back and say, are we doing the wrong thing? Do we have to correct it? So all I'm saying, go back, correct your system so that it, money doesn't just flow in that one direction. It is divided, it's shared by everybody else. Mm -hmm. All the wealth is shared by everybody else. And it, it seems to be the thing that accelerates it is that at, at the core of that, of that model of the economy, which is focused on, which, which surely delivers a lot of benefits, but it's focused on trade, it's focused on continued production. There is, there is at the core of it a lack of appreciation of, uh, as you've noted, just the fundamental uh, diversity of people, right? That people aren't simply selfish, but they have a selflessness about them, that, they, that, they, that they, they, they matter more than simply what their job is or what they, or what they do every day. For those people who, are, who vote for Trump, who voted for Brexit, dislocated people from the middle class and from the, and from the lower middle class, who, as you say, get their attention diverted to, to people who aren't actually the cause of their problems, at the root of their discomfort is a sense that the economy doesn't work for them, doesn't fully recognize who they are as people, that they don't find meaning in their, in their work. Now, the, the, the solution that they fall for is not the right one, but the cause of it is, is the same thing that you've recognized about the thing that people don't get about the poor, right? No. That satisfaction doesn't come only from, from one's work, right? And, no. uh, and that dislocation that people feel is a lot about their, their place in the, in the current yeah. economy. Can I ask you about politics quickly? <laughs> Go ahead. I want to ask you for this reason because the uh, 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 and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try to do it in a nice way because I because I, I have a lot of time for politicians uh, as it as it happens, but the the same things that that uh, in some ways that bankers didn't see right they didn't pay attention to the poor, didn't pay attention to people in the periphery and said they paid attention to people at the center, and they didn't pay attention to women rather than rather than men. How many of these problems do you think plague? Our politics, our explanations of why we, 
why we don't have uh, a different politics than we have now? And do you think that there is a, do you have a vision of what politics will look like in this new economy, how it'll be different than how it is now? Uh, the moment you open up uh, the whole ha other half of human being, at least half, if not more, uh, the selflessness, the economy and the politics will change. Because you're not saying that uh, you vote for me because I'll create more jobs for you. Uh, you vote for me because uh, uh, our economy will be growing bigger and bigger. Because the simple question is, economy is growing, but growing for whom? Whose economy is growing? So where am I for the, in that growth? Am I included or am I just uh, in the periphery watching that happening? So naturally, if you open that up, the selfless part of it, those who are in businesses and so on uh, will, have, will also open it up. And otherwise, they will ask why you are concentrating on making only money, nothing else. Mm. And even before this is happening in a global way, Many companies are debating this issue now. What is the meaning of business? And there are many issues have been raised mm -hmm. in the past, and now it's becoming louder and louder. You talk about the B Corps bank, uh, companies, so that uh, it's not maximization of profit. It's a, some limited profit, but basically it's helping people or solving people's problem. Uh, there's B Team. There's another group of... Uh, uh, business, big, big business people, mega business, uh, they combine together, call themselves B team. Uh, their argument is uh, we have to move away of profit maximization. Profit maximization is, uh, a, is a disastrous path because it will destroy the planet, destroy the society. So we have to move it away. They are, their uh, platform, the B, uh, B team, uh, is to put three Ps instead of one P. One P representing profit maximization, three P representing profit, planet, and uh, people. These are the three Ps that you have. And give all three Ps equal standing. It's not like you maximize profit and say we also did some good things for people, we also did something good for planet, no. Whole, all business has to write three annual reports with equal importance. Mm -hmm. That this is what we have done for business, making money. This is we have done for people. This is our plan in the beginning of the year. And this is what we have done at the end of the year. We are successful. We are a failure. We have not done. We have done. Uh, this is what you have done for the planet. And the auditors will be auditing all three reports before you go to the board so that whether the company, the management has done a good job or a bad job. So you will not be assessed by their performance in the stock market only. So you have to have other markets mm -hmm. for what you have done for the people, what you have done for the planet, and so on. That's how you'll be judged. Mm -hmm. And that will be the more whole objective of the co companies themselves. But today, you're raising these issues, but you're not institutionalized yet. No, no. You, you have an institution like a stock market. Everybody understands. And all the companies are uh, management people are shake. Uh, what the result would be tomorrow morning about my company's uh, share, share market value. Uh, so forget about the people, forget about the planet. Only test I have is to get the profit, uh, the share market price go up and the speculation pushes it up and so on. So unless that kind of judgment is removed, that institution is now de de decentralized and to include many other factors into it, You'll, you are a victim of that institution because that will guide you, that will make the judgment on you in every case. Every businessman, every business executive is, is bound by that mm -hmm. uh, institution's judgment. So this is what we have to get out of it. Uh, if we, the moment we introduce that subject into our academic, because the whole thing is the academic issue, mm -hmm. that do we practice it, uh, do we tell our young people that there are two kinds of business? Unless we tell them that there are two kinds of business, no matter how much you go around tell that there's a social business, is very attractive, it will not go very far. Mm -hmm. Because mindset is created at the schools, at the colleges, at the universities where we teach. They go out and say, this is what the economy is all about. So they take it seriously and they practice it. Mm -hmm. And then if you have these two kinds of businesses, you have to have two kinds of business schools. Today's business school train young people to go out join the companies so that they can make the maximum 
money for their shareholders. That's what they're trained for. They're kind of uh, mercenaries getting mm. ready mm. to go out and fight the war yeah. so that they can bring you more money for the company. That's what they're trained for. Mm. I said, you have to have two kinds of business school, or same business school with two degrees. One degree who will go into make profit maximizing company. Another degree who will be going out, setting up social businesses and making social business mm -hmm. success in solving problems and doing things in the way that uh, creates uh, an environment where you can proceed and expand your business, not to make money, to remove the barriers, remove the uh, problems that you have in front of you. So they'll be trained for that and they'll go around and do that. There'll be, there'll be criteria how to judge the effectiveness of your managers who are running this and so on and so forth. So, so that those are the things you'll be trained. Because if you take the uh, MBA, meaning that those who have been trained to make more money, mm -hmm. if you make him the manager of a social business, this guy will not understand what this business is all about. Mm -hmm. He's been trained to make more money. He doesn't. He said, how do I solve problems? Mm -hmm. I don't know. He, he comes with policies to make money. But that's not what the company is created for. So there'll be mismatch. We need a different kind of young people who will be the managers of this new breed of companies so that they understand. And they go to the same right track so they don't deviate from the track. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that are important, how to institutionalize this. And another thing is important in the school level, in the education level, is to familiar, make the young people familiar that I'm not a job seeker. I'm an entrepreneur. So they have to be told that you have two, two options. You can be job seeker or you can be an entrepreneur. If I'm a job seeker, here's the rule to follow. These are the steps that you have to go. If you are an uh, entrepreneur, this is your path. Mm -hmm. And an interesting change between the two is in order to be a job seeker, you have to complete your education to get that piece of paper. Without that piece of paper at the end of your school, uh, you are not going to get a job because you have to present that. Mm -hmm. And that opens the door for you to do that. But if you are an entrepreneur, that piece of paper is not important for you. Mm -hmm. You want to understand life or whatever. For that reason, you are here. And you want to do business in their role. Uh, and you understand what kind of business I want. So you learn the things that you need, mm -hmm. not for a final piece of paper for me. Paper doesn't mean anything. He or she wants to be successful in the business in solving problems. And that's the goal. And in the social business, students, <coughs> sorry, in entrepreneurs, students can start the business where in the school. Mm. But it's very difficult for a person to start the final job, not the temporary job that you do, uh, small jobs that you, uh, until you get the final piece of paper. So these are the varieties that you create in the system, and people grow into that system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope what we can do is, is, in some cases, is find this 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 middle path between them, where you where you you know you you ask students not to set themselves on a path at the start, but you make them see themselves as someone who's going to spend time in different places. That they're going to spend time in a public sector for a period of time, and perhaps they'll work in a business, and they may work in that third sector in a, oh, in a social you can, business. You can make them all of them instead of just dividing them up. Yeah. All of them have the exposure. If you want to be a job seeker, if you want to start a job, that's your life. If that's your career, this is what you do. Everybody understands. But if you're an entrepreneur, this is the kind of thing you do. Everybody has to understand that. Yes. So they will be, sometimes they will be working, sometimes they will be running businesses. Yes, yeah. Same, it doesn't have to be a lifelong job or a lifelong business. No, they can is, shift back and forth. This that's is also it. possible. This is it. And, and to see this, sure. this new economy where you don't have a job for your whole life, in fact, Absolutely. as an opportunity, sure. not, as a, yeah. not as a drawback. So you have a cho more choice. Yes. Now, we only need to get you here to teach our students <laughs> all our problems are solved. Uh, I'd invite you to come up to the microphone if you've got questions. Uh, queue up. And I'll just remind you that we're, we're short on time. And uh, so there's that, that saying, right? The first sentence should be a question. There should be no second sentence. OK. So please. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Ilmana Fassi, and I'm from United Way, which is the largest charitable organization in North America that talks about, uh, that supports people in poverty and prevent people who are at risk of poverty. We recently had a research done by University of Toronto and our United Way, which showed that the biggest cities in Canada, and we're talking of Canada, which is considered the top destinations to live in the world, uh, according to some standards. 
in 1980 in Toronto and Peel region, which had 2% neighborhoods termed as low income, has now in 2016 increased to 52%. Wow. The middle class has literally disappeared. So from 77% uh, of middle class, it has become 16%. The upper classes remain the same as 15 to 20%. My question to you is, our province here is doing a very interesting pilot project, and I'm a huge supporter of it, called Universal Basic Income in three uh, different uh, uh, neighborhoods. And there are some other countries also doing. So uh, you talk of entrepreneurship. Do you think providing individuals with support for their food and shelter, which do not have to look after, will help in this universal basic income to support entrepreneurship and will also reduce uh, uh, women abuse and all those things which occur because women are not able to come out and be economically uh, independent. I would like to know your views on universal basic income. I was just explaining a few minutes back uh, privately when we were discussing. Uh, when I was working in the village in Bangladesh, uh, I could come up with an idea, why don't I give a $50 grant to everybody. All, every woman comes, I give $50. And I give every month $50 so that they can <coughs> take care of themselves. I could have done that if I had money. Uh, would that be a better thing? Or I give them a $50 loan instead so that you work and pay me back and you take a bigger loan and continue to grow and we grow with you so that we can continue to support you. If that choice was given to me, I will automatically say I'll give it a loan so that she can use her talent, her creativity, and her self dignity and pleasure of knowing who she is. And that's the life it would be. Uh, so I'm avoiding that uh, universal income, which is a charity. I don't see human beings should live life on charity. I'm, uh, in a way, partially I'm opposed to welfare system. I said welfare system uh, for part one is OK meaning that for a few years it's okay. If you're in this terrible situation because of the circumstances around you, you lost everything, you, society has to take care of you, like a family member. You take it. But the family member, as a family member, I cannot take care of you for the rest of your life. You're a healthy person. Go ahead and do something. So the second part of uh, welfare system would be help them get out of health welfare. That part doesn't exist. And that's my complaint all along. Why can't we help them get out in, by their own choice, not because somebody forced them out? I don't want to force them out. I want to make attractive a proposition for them so that they say it's an exciting thing to be outside. So that's for the welfare. When you say basic in them, it sounds to me, it's universal, universal basic in terms sounds to me, universal welfare system. Keeping people alive without doing anything. I, I will not support that. I would rather find a way of why they cannot work. I will find the solution for that. And I said, they, they can't find work. This find, work doesn't exist. Finding work is a wrong thing in the first place. That's what I'm saying. Why are you looking for work? Why don't you do it yourself? Become an entrepreneur. That's why I keep saying that all we are entrepreneurs. We didn't say the poor women, go and find a job. We didn't say that. We said, come on, do something yourself. And she figured out what to do. And if illiterate women in Bangladesh, in the rural area, can start a business, I don't see why an educated person in Toronto cannot do a business. That beats me. I can understand that. Please. Oh, sorry. No, no. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yunus, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Like, they're very you. insightful. Uh, my name is Mansoor, and I work in a financial institution. Um, I was going to ask you a question around when you talked about poverty and income disparity as a system, systematic issue or a system issue. Um, I see there's two levels. There's these institutions, and then there's this individual level as well. Where uh, So at the institutional level, how do you think this paradigm shift is occurring? And as us, as individuals in our own capacity, how do we contribute to that? And secondly, at an individual level, how do we then uh, move that gauge from selfishness to selflessness um, as we're currently a part of the system itself? See, we're in an academic institution right now. And this is where the ideas are formed. This is how institutions are built. This is how theories are set. This is how theories are demolished. So if something is wrong happened in our theory, 
if we build the theoretical machine which doesn't function the way we expect it to function, it's our job in an academic world to fix it so that it does the job we are expecting to do. Otherwise, we are not a good machine maker. We, are not, we didn't do the machine which serves the purpose. So that's why I come back to the academic institution so that we can fix it and fix the institutions, fix the policies, fix, fix the concepts so that we have a world that we want. Today we see the whole world is collapsing, but still we go and repeating the same thing over and over again. I keep telling that if you go through the same old road, you always end up with the same destination, same result. You don't get different results, but you same. If you want a different kind of outcome, if you want a different kind of world, you have to build the new roads. And that's the new roads to be built here. So this is our responsibility. We have to get involved in that. For anyone in their individual capacity who might not be affiliated with an academic institution, any advice for those people? Sure, you can also participate. Academic doesn't mean a building, it's a person that you think academically, uh, you think abstractly that what is going wrong, can I do something? Uh, when I was doing it, in, it's coming from my experience, I didn't do it as an academic person. I did it as a human being trying to do it. That's what I said, I didn't start with writing up a big research proposal that three years research proposal to study loan sharking in the village of Bangladesh. I didn't do that. That would be an academic exercise. But I did it as a person. I, I see, can I do it? I could have been anywhere and start asking the same question. Can I do it? Anybody, any human being, anybody can do this. Here is a very powerful people sitting here. But anybody in the street can do that. It is, it is within the capacity of a human being. That's all we want. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Selena. I'm an alumna of the School of Public Policy and Governance. Um, both development studies and public policy as disciplines, I think, uh, one of the common things that is talked about is being wary of universalism, being wary of one-size-fits-all programs and policies to apply to lots of different contexts. And I find your um, conversation very interesting because it's about maybe not necessarily that we've gotten the meta-narrative um, that it's problematic, but that we've gotten something wrong about universalism and human nature. Um, my question to you is, do you think that uh, local, culturally specific applications of your program is sort of incompatible to what you're discussing, or is there room for um, locally determined, culturally specific applications? There's room for culture, there's room for uh, bigger culture, not a local culture. Uh, there's one big culture, the human culture. As a human being, we create one culture. This is what we do. That's why we talk about selfishness, selfishness. It's not a local culture. It's a human thing, that we express ourselves in these two both ways. And it is applicable to every single human being, wherever it is. But there may be something local version of that kind of thing. They emphasize more on the selflessness religious uh, dimension comes into it. That the one uh, religion emphasized that you sacrifice yourself for other people. That's your nirvana. That's what you go out. Uh, uh, your human life is completely fulfilled. And so those are the things you adopt and you practice. But the theory comes as a kind of neutral thing. It is not a local culture. So it's, it's a universal thing. That this is what you are. Like the one that I was... Uh, Attacking is the interpretation of that I'm a uh, self-interest-driven person. I said, I don't accept that. I'm not a self-interest-driven person. Uh, I'm, I'm more driven by something else beyond my self-interest. So if I'm there, maybe some, somebody like me exists. And I see it's not one or two. It's a whole, all human beings are like that. They have the, all these two elements in that. Then why don't you use it? Why don't you facilitate it? Why don't you accommodate it in our space, in our economic theory and so on and so forth, and in our institution building? So that's what I'm appealing in there and giving some examples. Because I have done something and I said it excites me and I feel that excitement. And I share that excitement to other people by saying, I say, making money is a happiness. And that's why people want to make money. This is their happiness. This is their incentive. And I say, making money is happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. So you want to enjoy that super happiness by involving yourself in solving people's problems. So that's incentive, another incentive. 
So don't get stuck with one incentive. There are many incentives. I give two examples of the example. Once you get involved with the um, touching people's lives, it's a very intoxicating experience. Once you do that, you can't get over it. You want to do, continue to do that. But one, if you've never done it, you'll never know about that thing. So I said, please try it out. If you try it out, you feel that super happiness that you, you get out of doing that. So that's the challenge that I make. And I said, why don't the academic world discuss that issue and dismiss that? If they said this is a crazy idea, there's some uh, band of tribes believe in it, but it's nothing to do with human beings. That's OK. But allow it to be examined. That's all. Sir. Yes, uh, Robin Larid. Uh, this is Muhammad Ali Bukhari. Uh, I know you from my childhood. And I know enormous uh, work you have done in Bangladesh. And over the years, I have supported writings in Bangladesh in difficult times. But today, I take the liberty to question to you something that uh, the book uh, you emphasized on a world of three zeros, uh, focusing on poverty, unemployment, and net carbon emission. Uh, we have seen and we studied as a student of economics uh, that uh, full employment never be possible in economy and uh, nowhere in the world. And when we consider the book uh, of the philosopher Jean-Paul Charté, the what is subjectivity? And you have focused on that 99% that movement which was uh, ignited in New York City in 2011 and world around we have seen afterward. Now, Professor Peter also focused that uh, immigration thing and also the social business aspiration. But the problem is there is no full employment and Donald Trump is walk out from the Paris Climate Accord. How you will adjust to this problem of the world and eliminate and reach to the zero? Yeah. See, uh, you are still looking from the other angle. Uh, that's not how I thought about the unemployment issue. When I say zero unemployment, I said the whole problem of unemployment is created by the concept of employment. If we didn't have the concept of unemployment, there is no unemployment. If you're not looking for employment, where will be unemployment? I said all of us are entrepreneurs. We are not looking for employment. That's why I say zero unemployment, because we are not looking for employment. That's what I'm emphasizing. Not that we are looking for a job and everybody got a job. That's not the zero unemployment I'm talking about. I'm talking about we are not looking for it because we can do it on our own. We are entrepreneurs. We are not job seekers. That's the reason, and that's the explanation I gave. What you about uh, Mr. Donald Trump walked out from this uh, Paris Climate Accord? Crazy people do crazy things. Do you think that will hamper no, no. your vision towards this zeroing to the net carbon emission? Well, just because Donald Trump has done that, that doesn't mean USA has done that. Lots of governors showed up in Paris this year to celebrate the Paris Agreement last year. So celebrate that. Uh, governors came in, mayors came in. So we, are, we said we are fully behind it, not 100%. Now we are 120% to compensate for the thing that Donald Trump is talking about, so that he is never get the chance to make it happen. So it's, Donald Trump is not United States, so far as uh, tr climate change is concerned. Uh, so the people of the United States is the important thing, what they feel about it. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, hi, Dr. Yunus. Hi. Uh, my name is Samantha, and um, I started a small-scale project um, providing micro-grants in Bangladesh. Um, in a vi village, my father's village, um, and I, like so, where we pro provide the startup costs for purchasing something like a vehicle, like CNG, so that they can become self-sustainable. Um, so right now, it's a small-scale project. I was wondering, um, like, what was the biggest challenge that you faced when you went from a small-scale operation to then forming a bank, um, aside from the government regulations? Are you lending money or just giving it? It's giving it. So it's supposed to be a charity. Then you have no problem. Yeah, OK. <laughs> There's no, the like, The moment you give tape. a loan, then you have a problem. <laughs> yeah. If you give something away, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, you, uh, see, ho you hope for the best so that he's successful. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, 
I mean, if you if you're giving a vehicle like CNG or whatever you do, uh, see that he safely drives in the road and earns enough money for himself. That's all. Uh, you, you, you don't cross into any any other thing because you are not institution building. Mm -hmm. well, the moment you get into institution building, lots of other issues come. But yeah. here you are just giving somebody some. You're doing good thing. I'm not just uh, saying that you're bad thing. But this is one and unique thing. You gave him money so that he can buy. Uh, himself, uh, yeah, and it becomes still sustainable by then. It, you know, being able to, yeah. being able to provide. Hopefully, like, he will earn enough to maintain that. Hopefully, he will not come back and say, "My car broke, broke down. Give me some more money." <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what you should avoid. <laughs> and in terms of like the logistics, though, like you know, yeah. when you go, like when you're managing that many, you know, lo like uh, borrowers, yeah. Um, like, what were there any issues in that sense? Like, yeah, when you go big, when you become large, like millions and millions of people. Uh, daily transactions, every little penny to be accounted. You need a big system, build it up, mm -hmm. so that you don't make mistakes. Because the whole system of Grameen system is built on trust. If you made a mistake that I gave you the money, next day you say, no, I didn't get you money. You break the trust. The guy okay. starts suspecting you, okay. that you are not a dependable person. The moment he, she feels that you are not dependable, you have eroded the whole basis of the system. So we are very careful that she never doubts what we do. No doubt about the system, no doubt about the accounting, because it's a minute accounting. Very small amount of money transacted. But for her, it's a very precious amount. Mm -hmm. She worked very hard to pay you back this money every week. So we wanted to make sure she can come back. Last month, I gave you on such and such day so much. Somehow I see in my book, it's not recorded. So we have to go back what our recorders and her recorders, and tell it, look, your record is right. No problem. You did the same thing, this is what it is. So the nurse is okay, they know. Even I go back one month, they can track back and bring it to me that the, I paid exactly the amount they recorded into it. Those kind of things. So anything big, like, you, like we, Grameen Bank has something like 25,000 staff. Managing 25,000 staff, dispersed all over the country, it's not an easy task. Mm -hmm. You have to dis have the rules, procedures, everybody has a confidence in it. Yes, I'll be treated well, I'll not be forgotten. I'll, in due time, I'll get a promotion. In due time, I'll get the right kind of behavior from this uh, institute and those kind of things. So this is a standard procedure. Okay. Thank you. One, well, sorry, one last No, 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 oh, no okay. sorry. That's uh, it. Sir, you have a big responsibility. You have the last question, so you have to okay. ask the one that everyone is wondering. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Great, Dr. News, thank you very much thank you. for coming to speak with us today. I started a social business uh, empowering uh, local communities in uh, rural Tanzania with solar. Okay. And we had to raise money privately um, from investors that are, were looking for both a, you know, a financial and a social return. So how do you do that with folks you know, on your system without looking for a financial return? Secondly, capitalism has brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the last few decades. And you're calling on that system to change. Uh, my question would be really two parts. What can the government do, right? Or what can anyone do to help companies that want to raise money um, because investors want a financial and social return? And isn't capitalism good? Like, hasn't it had all these great benefits for people over the last few decades? Uh, if you listen to me uh, from the beginning, I am not here pleading that destroy capitalism, we don't need it. That's not what I said. I said capitalism has serious flaws. We have to fix it. I'm always I'm using the word fix it. So it's a fixing problem. It's not over wholesale abandoning. Let's take another one. And there's, there's another alternative doesn't exist. So this is the one that we have, however it is. But these are fixable things. That's an, my argument is. If you fix this part, it changes all the bad things they do. The fact that all the money, is, all the wealth is concentrated in fewer hands, this is the reality. And you cannot go on like this. That's a warning that I'm giving. People are not paying enough attention to it. I said, I'm drawing attention to it. If I'm unnecessarily concerned, alarmed, you say, no, 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 it's not as bad as you think. That's fine. But I'm alarmed, and I want to communicate it to them. I didn't say that capitalism has not helped poor people get out of poverty. They have. It has. But poor people are coming one inch above their level. 
and getting out of poverty. That guy has gone five miles in the meantime. That's what I'm saying. Because I could have gone several miles in the meantime, but I didn't get that chance. I got only a little inch. That inching should not be accepted as something that is good for us. You stay where you are, I stay, and I zoom to the sky completely. That's what I'm arguing. I have the same capacity as that guy has. I'm not different than that guy. So I said, system keeps me here, and the system, if I get one inch, he gets 10 miles. And that's what the system does. I said, that is wrong. System can do both same thing. If he goes 10 miles, I go 10 miles too. I can do that. System has kind of discriminatory uh, kind of treatment for us. And about the uh, re financial return, and of course, you need financial return if you go, want to get the uh, investment. There are institutions available where they look at their return. That's what the capitalist system is all about. Show how much you make so that they want to share it. So that's not the argument. I said, in social business, we are not interested in personal return. And that's a new aspect. I do the business to solve the problem. I see a guy who used to live with the kerosene lamp. Now he doesn't have to have the kerosene lamp. He has a beautiful solar system. He, they don't get into the problems of fossil fuel, all the respiratory diseases because of the kerosene and all that. Now, but I didn't want to create that to make money for myself. I did it to solve his problem. And I don't take a penny out of the business. Business makes money. But that money stays with the business, it's not to me. It doesn't belong to me. That's the only difference. Okay. Thank you. Thank can you. I, I want just, to, no, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't. Uh, I, I want to ask Friha to come up and give uh, some closing remarks, please. And I want you all to uh, thank Friha because she is the person who initiated Dr. Yunus's visit uh, to SPPG. That's today. a big applause. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Friha Ikra, and as a master's student at the School of Public Policy and Governance, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, as I glance around the room, I can see that many of us are students of public policy. Some here are faculty members at this school, and others here are respective community leaders. But what brought us here together is that we have one common purpose. It's a desire to make our cities, our communities, our countries, and our world a better place. For those of you who believe in Dr. Yunus's vision, a better world consists of one without poverty. It consists of one where the gap between the rich and poor cease to exist. And it also consists of one where we empower women for generations of today, tomorrow, and the future. Dr. Yunus, on behalf of the School of Public Policy and Governance, I wanna thank you for being here today for challenging, educating, and inspiring the policymakers of today and tomorrow. Thank you so very much. Thank you.